Good morning and welcome to this time of worship here at Rosenberg First Methodist Church. My name is Jeremy. I'm the pastor here and I'm grateful for your choice to be with us and also grateful to be back in the sanctuary recording live again this week. Uh, if you've been with us the last couple of weeks, you know COVID worked its way through our family. Uh, thankfully, all those symptoms and everything have resolved and we're all uh, back and healthy and getting back into the swing of work and everything else. Uh, so thank you for your prayers and thank you for your patience as we got all that figured out and, and took care of, of the uh, family's health. Uh, I do want to share a couple of announcements and things before getting any farther into this time of worship. Uh, it is Ash Wednesday coming up this Wednesday. Uh, from 9 to 10 a.m., we're going to do sort of a drive-by ashing. Uh, so if you want to come by just for a very brief moment of meditation to receive the sign of the ashes, you can come by through the alleyway between 9 and 10 a.m. on Wednesday. That evening at 7 p.m., we'll do a full kind of formal service. Uh, we'd love to have you there for us, uh, with, join us with us in person if you're able to do that. Uh, we're also going to post an online uh, reflection meditation uh, similar to the, the main uh, reflection in the in-person worship service, uh, so, but online it won't be a, a kind of sort of a full worship service. It'll be just a moment of reflection uh, for you to do whenever you can throughout the day. So we'll post that in the morning on Ash Wednesday, uh, and whenever you're able to tune in and, and take a look at that, uh, I would encourage you to do that as we reflect on the meaning and the importance of Ash Wednesday. The next day, uh, on Thursday, we're going to have uh, uh, Mets game day over in the fellowship hall. So if you're a part of that group or want to join for a game day, we'd love to have you. I believe that starts at 10 a.m. Uh, on Thursday, March the 3rd. Uh, the next Wednesday is going to be our grief support group getting going. That's called Joy Comes in the Morning. Uh, Reverend Don Story will be leading that. Uh, that'll go for six weeks throughout the season of Lent, uh, every Wednesday at 10 a.m. Uh, let us know in the church office if you want to join for that, uh, and we'd love to have you come again Wednesdays at 10 a.m. throughout Lent. The last thing I want to mention uh, is that we did have a leadership board meeting this week. Uh, there's a, a few decisions and things that we uh, both made and are continuing to work on. There is a full update uh, linked in the notes to the service. I'd encourage you to take a look at that uh, to read through it. It's just one page kind of front and back. Uh, two ways that you can support the church if you would like to help out. Uh, one of the things we're, we've decided to do is to, to move our offices. Uh, they're going to be moved over to what has been previously used as the nursery building. If you want more details, again, uh, take a look at that link in the, in the service notes. Uh, we also did a little bit of work at, at the parsonage. Um, we had some uh, gutter repair work and, and things like that. Uh, so if you want to support financially either of those two projects, simply click the giving link below and you can select either parsonage to support that work or um, the um, office move project. Uh, we're hoping the office move will be kind of revenue neutral at the end of the day, uh, but if you want to sponsor a particular item or, or um, help us out to be able to maybe upgrade a little bit of equipment as we make that move, uh, you're certainly welcome to do so. If you also want to help out with actually like physically moving stuff or looking through things in our current office space or uh, anything involved in that project, uh, simply let us know. But there's a few other notes. Uh, Jennifer Hartman is going to be our newest board member starting in March. Uh, a couple other things that are certainly worth your time to take a look at in that full uh, board update. And as always, if you have questions or concerns about any of it, uh, reach out to us anytime in the church office. We're continuing to find ways to be faithful, to find ways to lay a foundation for a sure future, and in all things seeking to trust in our God more and more each day as we move forward and continue to make a difference in this community. So it's in the hope and the spirit of a God who is with us always that we turn now to our God for this time of worship.
Well, friends, we come once again to our time of prayer. This is a time when we remember that there is nothing we have to hide from our Lord. We're invited out to lay it all at the foot of the cross, trusting that God will receive our prayers and through it all will make us new. And friends, I have to say this has been a a bit of a scary week as I'm recording this. Uh, It appears that Russia has just initiated a kind of a full-scale assault and and war on on Ukraine. Uh, By the time Sunday comes around, I don't know where that situation will be. Uh, But I certainly want to ask for your prayers uh, of peace, for your prayers uh, of courage, and um, the prayers of of healing for all those who are going to be affected. Uh, Again, we have no idea what the long-term consequences will be or what what will even happen by Sunday whenever this uh, service comes out. Uh, But I know that there will be a loss of life, tragedy, trauma, uh, all sorts of other effects uh, from this conflict wherever it winds up going. So I want to encourage us to, to lift up all those people who are affected by this conflict, to ask for God's peace and God's strength uh, to face whatever the future may hold in all of this. And in, through it all, whatever may happen, uh, that on the other end, we would begin to find healing and, and resolution uh, going forward. So it's in the hope and it's in the spirit of a God who is with us, of a God who goes by our side, and a God who is by our side through everything that is to come. In that spirit, let us turn to our God for this time of prayer. Almighty God, be present with us now. Give us your strength. Grant us your peace. And remind us that you are the God who conquered even death itself, so that in you we might find abundant life. In this fearful moment, as the future remains uncertain, strengthen us to cast our cares upon you to trust in your strength, to trust in your love whose power knows no bounds. Our prayers go out especially to those in Eastern Europe and the continent of Asia, those who are touched by the tragedies and trials of this conflict. We pray for resolution. We pray ultimately for peace. And we pray for the strength to be your children through it all to give witness to your power that alone conquers our imperfections and overcomes our fears and failures. To whatever that may look like and wherever we go from here, let us be agents of your Son, Jesus Christ, to offer healing and wholeness, strength and forgiveness, to offer the world a sign of your mighty power God, receive all of our cares and concerns as well, all our trials and struggles, the illnesses we face, whatever we may be going through. In our times of joy and celebration, remind us of all those good and perfect gifts you've given to us. Let your goodness overflow from us. Let it be the seed that plants change, that brings about your kingdom. So whatever we face, wherever we go from this moment, remind us that you are with us. Remind us that your grace is more than enough and strengthen us to trust in you more and more each day. We pray these things in your son's name as we join in the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our primary scripture reading for the day comes from 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. Hear now the word of the Lord. I am grateful to Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me because he judged me faithful and appointed me to his service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a man of violence. But I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But for that very reason I received mercy, so that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display the utmost patient patience, making me an example to those who would come to believe in him for eternal life. 
To the King of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, hide me behind your cross so that it might be your word that is spoken this day, so that it might be your Holy Spirit that touches our lives and makes us new. Amen. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. In hearing these words from Paul, I cannot help but think of the words of the late great Muhammad Ali. I am the greatest. Now I know Paul is actually trying to say, I am the worst, but it's hard to hear those words without hearing it with a twinge of arrogance. Paul has to be the single most recognizable leader of the church in his day. For him to say that I am the foremost sinner is to say that there is something more going on underneath those words. You can't hear those words without recognizing how much they really mean. And to be fair to Paul, we're a lot more used to people sounding arrogant in their humility than they probably were back in the day. It's a strategy we see all the time in social media and on the news. These days, people are incredibly good at knowing how to turn even the most humiliating act of self-sacrifice into a means of personal exaltation. That wasn't quite the case in the same way back then. But he still says, I am the foremost sinner. And it's easy for us to hear that as, I am the greatest at sinning. I'm the greatest at sinning. I'm the greatest at admitting it. I'm the greatest at receiving Christ's forgiveness. Therefore, I simply am the greatest, the greatest follower of Christ, the greatest Christian, the greatest, the greatest all over. And he's like, he's saying, look at me if you want to learn how to live. It takes a certain kind of person to speak with that sort of clarity that's bordering on arrogance. It'd be a stretch to suggest that Paul's motives here are deeply problematic, but it is fair to point out that he walked and talked with a great deal of self-assurance. I'm not trying to say that he's simply making this up in order to make himself look good. He clearly thought what he had to say. He clearly thought the way that he lived was how things ought to be done. There's clearly a deep bit of sincerity here because he's never one to mince words. He's never one to hold back an opinion as he wrote many of the letters that, that form our New Testament to this day. He had so much to say that his letters actually account for far more books of the New Testament than any other author. He says, I am the greatest, the greatest sinner, that is. And when we hear that kind of language, we know to be a bit wary and on guard. It's a high ceiling and a high calling to avoid taking that statement of humility and making it into a rally cry of arrogance. We've got to be sure we're not simply saying, I'm the worst, to say that lift ourselves up as the actual greatest. And so it's easy to hear Paul's claim and immediately think the opposite attitude is really the way for Christians to act and to think. It's easy to hear this words to fear we're calling ourselves the greatest and to think the good Christian should never draw attention to themselves. The proper Christian way to act only puts emphasis on Christ and no one else. The proper Christian way to act, we might tell ourselves, says that the only holy and honorable thing for us to brag about is how bad we are given how great Christ is, reminding others how forgiven we are, reminding others how great Christ's forgiveness is. And so we don't want to draw too much attention to ourselves without being sure that all we're doing is focusing our eyes upon Christ. I mean, after all, it is all too human to hide our imperfections. To avoid Paul's proud admission can play right into that fear. It's easy to try and say very little, to stay very quiet. We don't want to sound arrogant in our admissions of fault, so we won't admit any fault at all. And in either direction, we wind up playing to the same basic issue. Because now that we've solved that problem, now that we're making sure we're not sounding arrogant by admitting our insecurities, we're trying to eliminate the possibility of arrogance altogether. And then we just go in the opposite direction. So no longer is it the case that we're showing off how great we are in our need for forgiveness, but now to the untrained eye, we're simply acting as though all is well. We either come across as arrogant admitting our mistakes, putting them front and center, or we simply say nothing, and we act as though we have it all together. 
And I think the people around us can tend to assume that about Christians all the time. We either talk a big game about how forgiven we are and sound like we've got it all together being forgiven all the time, or we say nothing at all, and people just assume that our life must be great. And so we have to be understanding of this tension and this balance. We need forgiveness, and we can't just assume that we're not saying it because there's nothing that needs to be forgiven. I mean, have you ever thought to yourself in one of those moments, have you ever thought I must be the only person in this meeting or in this room with no idea what's going on? Have you ever thought to yourself, everyone else is so much more prepared and educated and ready to work? I'm the only one here with no clue about this trendy topic. I must be the only one who snaps at my kids when the stress of work carries over at home. I must be the only one who's ever walked into the kitchen to make dinner and forgotten what I was doing and then found myself an hour behind once I finally figured out what it is that I had been planning before. Have you ever thought to yourself, I'm the one who's not worthy of this job or these people or this community? Have you ever had those thoughts in your mind? Because if you've ever had these or any similar thoughts, you're not alone. The person on your left and the person to your right has had a similar kind of thought at some point in their lives. I personally do it all the time. I mean, it's incredibly common for me to make mistakes and to feel like those mistakes make me unique. The opposite is far more true. It's only the one in a billion person who never makes mistakes. That's the person that's truly unique. And that's only true because they haven't yet been caught in their own mistakes or they haven't even admitted them to their self because everybody makes mistakes. We all fall short. No matter how obvious it should be that everyone struggles all the time, no matter how clear it is that no one actually knows what they're doing all the time in all situations, no matter how true and obvious that might be, it still has to be said. Everyone makes mistakes. And everyone at some point in time assumes that they're the only one, or they assume that their mistakes are so much worse, or that they're the only ones who don't understand in this particular instance. And I remember one of the most impactful bits of marriage advice I received from a pastor friend of ours just before Sally and I were married. This pastor friend told us a story about the first real fight that he and his wife had whenever they got married. You see, in this pastor friend's household, it was customary to have a few knockdown, drag out fights every so often. His dad and his mom would have it out, and they would have raised voices and all right in front of the kids. And after a while, once everything was out on the table, things would calm down, and apologies would be offered, and then things would go back to normal. The relationship was as solid as it ever had been before after those necessary apologies and mended feelings were had. So fighting like that for him was an integral part of the marriage. It was a sign of how strong your marriage was if you fought it out and apologized and moved on. And so that's what happened one day after they'd had their their first real fight. Things started to get a little heated. There were some words that were said and things started to escalate. And he thought he would take a step forward into them. He thought this was a great sign that their marriage was headed in the right direction because they were having this fight and then it was gonna be time to apologize, to mend the fences and to move on. But his wife, on the other hand, After they had that fight, she thought the marriage was over. You see, in her household, fighting never happened. She couldn't remember her her parents ever raising their voices at all, much less having a real knock-down, drag-out kind of fight. She assumed that fighting was not the key to a happy marriage. She assumed that if you fought, your marriage was in deep, deep trouble. And it turns out she would find much later that her parents did fight plenty. They just never did so in front of the kids. In front of the kids, they pretended always that they got along just fine. And I'm pretty sure that you can ask any married couple you know, fighting is going to happen at some point and in some form. It'll definitely look different for every couple. There are some better and worse, more hurtful and less hurtful ways to fight. That much is true. But no couple is perfect. Every couple's gonna have their issues. The main difference between our parents friends, or between our friends, parents fighting, was not whether or not fighting happened. Both sets of parents fought. The main difference there was whether or not they were willing to admit their fights to their kids. The main difference was their unwillingness to admit those flaws and model healthy conflict in their marriages. And that unwillingness 
to admit their flaws, that unwillingness to talk to their kids about how relationships happened, that unwillingness to go through it all with their children and to help them understand wound up deeply affecting the marriages of their children. Just because you don't know someone else's imperfections, just because you've never talked through the brokenness or understood what's really going on, just because you don't know the details doesn't mean the imperfection is not there. And of course, on the flip side, just because it's obvious that everyone has their imperfections doesn't mean it's a good practice to simply hide ours from the world. Hiding our imperfections in many ways has a way of cutting off ourselves from relationships. Trying to hide our imperfections, trying to be something that we're not, has a way of cutting ourselves off from community, from wholeness, from the kind of love and relationship that Christ desires for us to find. Because when we lie to the world, when we hide our flaws, there's no way to find the grace and the forgiveness, to find the humility that it takes to live together as one. Living out in the open, being able to admit our flaws to one another and work through them together, doing that well makes two things possible. First, showing the world what it means to make mistakes and to struggle through seasons of life. To do that in the open gives others an example toward which they can strive. There's something so beautiful, something so important about having role models in our lives, those people who help teach us how to live. I've said it before and I'll say it again that kids don't really listen to you, kids become you. They don't really care about the words that you say. They develop the habits that you form. They watch us. They watch their parents. They come to act more and more like them. And that way of showing off what it looks like to live through struggle, what it looks like to heal imperfections, what it looks like to mend relationships, that's something that can't be done as perfectly as they do it on TV at the end of an hour-long episode. Without those role models in our lives, we may never develop the habits to really understand, to work through difficult challenges. And that difference, that lack of a role model, could be the very difference between the first of many healthy fights in a marriage versus the first fight that truly ends the marriage. Having or being a role model that admits flaws and seeks forgiveness, that's a way to set people up in our lives to find healing and wholeness, to help model the kind of relationships, the kind of behaviors that make it possible to get through the toughest of times. And the second thing that happens whenever we are open about our flaws is that we create the space in which intimacy is possible. The vulnerability to let people in, to actually take down those shields, to admit that I am flawed, that's the only context in which intimacy actually exists. Otherwise, it's just a facade. Otherwise, it's just a mask that the world sees and might come to know. And it's obviously true that we cannot always let all people in our lives all the way in. There are certain types of friends with whom we will share more intimate details. There's a difference between what we'll say publicly versus what we might say to in a one-on-one -on -one kind of conversation. That much is absolutely true. But it's also vital that we find the people in our lives with whom we can let down those walls. When we let people in is when we find the possibility of love and acceptance without letting people behind those walls, without anyone seeing behind that mask. There's no possibility to find the depth of love and acceptance God desires for us to know. At the heart of the gospel message lies the one who came to show us the way. At the heart of the gospel message is the one who humbled himself, who chose vulnerability for himself in order to let us into the heart of God. Jesus showed us how to be present with one another, how to enjoy living and eating and talking and spending time with people in our lives, even people who look and think and talk nothing like us. Jesus invites us to seek forgiveness and to seek forgiveness because he did not shy away from taking on the sins and the failures of the whole world upon himself. He took it all on himself on the cross to show us the way, to offer a different, pathway forward, showing us this way, risking everything to invite us in. By living his life so thoroughly committed to both of these practices, Jesus might as well have been carrying his own sign that said, I am the greatest. Because through his willingness to act, through his commitment to make mercy a reality, that's how Jesus transforms us all. 
It's not just words of a message that Jesus offers us. It's teaching us how to live. It's making love and relationship possible. It's doing all of that to set the example for how we ought to love one another. Invite your neighbor in. Invite your neighbor in not because you've got it all figured out, but because we need partners for the journey. We're called to dare to admit that we are flawed. We're not the only one. We're never the only one. And the way that we can find acceptance through our flaws is when we can put them on the table with those closest to us in our lives. In this community called church, we're invited to be that kind of people. We're called to be the foremost sinners in search of the foremost forgiveness and healing. To do that both for each other and for the sake of God's whole world. That is the greatest ideal we could hope to live up to. To be the kind of community of love and forgiveness. To be beautifully flawed people. To be the community that points the world toward the hope we have in the love and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. That is our calling. That is our destiny. That is the pathway God lays out before us. To embrace our flaws even as we embrace the forgiveness, the power, the healing, the hope we have on the sure foundation of God's love and acceptance. That is our pathway forward. That's who we are as God's children. And that is what it means to follow the greatest to ever live. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, friends, thank you for being with us again today. This concludes another time of worship. Don't forget, Ash Wednesday is this week from 9 to 10 a.m. We'll do that drive-by um, meditation and our ashing moment. Uh, then in the evening, 7 p.m., we'll have our full service, and our, we'll post our online meditation uh, early in the day. Uh, Thursday is Senior Game Day. Next week begins our grief support group. Uh, and then, of course, there's that board update linked in the notes to the service. If you want to give to the Parsonage Project or to the office move, you can click the giving link and uh, designate your gift as such. 
Uh, but we uh, simply want to encourage you to take a look at that update. Uh, let us know in any feedback as we continue to make choices and figure out the best way we can move forward to continue to make an impact, to continue to make a difference, and above all else, to trust in where God is leading us in the season ahead. So friends, thank you again for being with us today. We look forward to seeing you on Ash Wednesday and again next week. So go in this moment to love and to serve our God, trusting that God is with us, that God has shown the way, and that God will be faithful to the very end. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.